All right, if you have your Bibles tonight, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians 10. And we're going to sort of walk through the whole chapter here tonight. Well, depending on how much time we have and how far we get. Let's read it together. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 1, it says, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold towards you. But I beseech you, that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trust to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. For his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such an one think this, that such as we are in word by letters when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord, for not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Man, he covers a lot of territory there. And um, But it, it seems like the, the real, um, sort of the theme and sort of the, the springboard for this whole chapter is in verse 2. He says, but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. And this chapter really seems to be aimed at that the, the word some. There were a few people there. There was this faction in the church there that was really creating an undercurrent. You know, in 1 Corinthians, you know, uh, the church was a disaster. And, uh, you know, Paul writes that letter. And um, between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, there's about a year or two somewhere in there. And man, they, they really jumped on it. They changed a bunch of things. Uh, you know, we've talked about it. You, you wouldn't even, I would not call that church in 1 Corinthians a church. It was, it was a zoo. If I knew a church like that, I wouldn't even call it a church. But it was indeed a church. And what's even more amazing than that is the change that took place in that year and a half after a bunch of people decided to really do something about what Paul wrote. And, and believe it or not, it changed the whole face of that church. Usually when a church is going down the tubes, uh, you know, it, there's no saving it. But man, a miracle occurred. And God did something. And so, you know, you come to chapter 10, and Paul, Paul mentions something that was present 
in the church, and that was even though great things had happened, there was this this uh, faction in the church. Uh, there was a an undercurrent, and uh, you know we don't know how many people it was. So, you know we're not told, but it probably was a small group. But they were working to um, to counteract the influence and the working and the moving of God. Um, they uh, they didn't like what was happening. Um, you know, it was Paul himself that had been the mouthpiece, and Paul that had written this letter. And you and I, you and I know that this is the word of God. But to them, it was a letter. Okay, and they get this letter, and Paul's influence begins to work, and it begins to correct things. And these people that are the undercurrent, um, whether they realized it or not. They were actually working against the moving of God. That'd be a terrible place to be, wouldn't it? You know, they're, they're, they don't like Paul. They don't like what's going on. And, and they start working against it. But they're working against God himself. Um, look at the tail end of verse 2. It says, which think of us, these, these people, this undercurrent, think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Um, they didn't believe that Paul and his helpers, they really didn't believe that this was, you know, of the Lord. They, um, as if we walked according to the flesh. In other words, these critics of Paul and his group, they were saying, uh, you know, who is Paul and who is, who is these other guys that are with Paul? Uh, they're no different than us. Um, and in their mind, they resented Paul's influence. And, um, you know, they, they accused Paul of having a fleshly motivation. In other words, uh, you know, we don't know exactly what the accusations were. But, you know, they were accusing Paul of trying to run things, you know. And, well, you know, Paul's just, you know, Paul's not even here. And, and you know, why do you guys listen to him? And he's just, he's just promoting his own agenda. And, and um and so they began to work against it, and they they felt like that they could uh, that Paul and Paul's group and their group they were all playing by the same rules. That's what they thought. Paul said, "You you think as if we're walking according to the flesh." He said, "But we're not." Um, you know when you're when you're uh, when you're fleshy, the rules you operate on is uh, it's fleshy rules. You know it, it gets spiteful. You know, it gets accusing people of, of false motives. You know, uh, fleshy means a lot of things. And um, these guys were denying that the Lord was actually calling the shots here. In, um, in verse 1 and 2, you see Paul doing something. He says, now I, Paul, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. He says, who, who in presence, he's referring to himself, who in presence and base among you. Look at verse 2. But I beseech you. Uh, Paul is pleading with them. And, um, and he, says it, he says, I beseech you. He says it twice. He's pleading. You know, you know what he's like when he does that? He's like his master. Um, Paul said, I beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Matthew 11, you know, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, Jesus said, and learn of me. He said, for I am meek. Uh, meek means ready ready to suffer injury at another person's hands. Look at, keep your place there. Keep your place in 2 Corinthians and look at 1 Peter 4 for just a moment. 1 Peter 4. You know, Paul has the authority here to roast them alive. 
You know, Paul had the authority to not write a letter and just come in and storm the place. He had the authority to do that. But he said, you know, he said, I'm, I'm, he says, I'm trying to be like Christ here. He says, I'm giving you lots of leeway. And he says, I'm pleading with you. Now, you know, um, uh, there's going to come a day when the Lord will not plead with people anymore at all. But you know what's going on right now? There's this lengthy period where the Lord is pleading with people. You know, he's just pleading. Uh, you know, Romans 12, and, and Paul writes that, but it's under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God. If you can, if you can picture the Creator of heaven and earth, and he's pleading. He's pleading. Paul was like his master. Look at 1 Peter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. You know what that is? That's the spirit of meekness. He says, you know, if, he says, you know, Christ has suffered for us. He said, you need to, uh, you need to take that as your own and prepare for what you're going to receive. And you need to receive it like he received it. Uh, look at uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 20. 1 Peter 2, verse 20. 1 Peter 2, verse 20. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted, that means when you take a beating, if ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. He said, what glory is that? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, Neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Paul in this passage, uh, he's addressing some real troublemakers there in the church. And, um, and Paul says, uh, he says, I'm, I'm beseeching you. You know, he says, I'm, I'm going to plead with you first. He says, I'm pleading that, you know, whoever you are, that you'll, you'll stop. Uh, the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. You know, uh, Christ was not brassy. Uh, Christ was not arrogant. Christ was not intimidating. Uh, Jesus Christ was not rough. Uh, he was not a smart aleck. He was not harsh. Um, you know, everybody that dealt with him, except the, except the hypocrites and the phonies, uh, except the, the Pharisees, everybody else that dealt with him found him kind and gracious and approachable, both saved and lost. And Paul says, I beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. But though Christ was meek and gentle, you know, remember, uh, he is the one that overthrew the tables in, in, in the temple. There, there was a time when that ended. Look at verse 3. Verse 3. So you see, the, you see the, uh, this faction and you see Paul pleading with them. But in verse 3, you see another thing, verse 3 and 4. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, in other words, in a human body, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. We do not, we do not operate. We do not behave. We do not act and react in a fleshy way. Verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare, and notice this is in parentheses, okay? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, 
Uh, in verse 3 and 4, Paul refers to something. And, and again, remember what he's got in view here. He's got in view this faction that's creating an undercurrent. And Paul says, uh, he says, we, we do know something about warfare. Um, but he says, we do not war after the flesh. And he talks about the weapons. Um, um, the weapons of the warfare uh, would not be fighting fire with fire. You know, it would not be, you know, uh, maneuvering and, and um, you know, it, it would be spiritual. It would be spiritual. Notice what he says there. And you guys have read this. You guys know these verses. But would you look at verse four again? And verse verse three, the end of the, the verse, we do not war after the flesh, verse four, for the weapons of our warfare. Um, you guys, you guys know this, but you know, I, I, I really, it, it seems that most Christians do not see uh, their Christianity as a warfare. Um, you know, they, um, they, I, I don't know what they think. They, they think it's, it's wonderful to have their sins forgiven, and they think it's wonderful to belong to the church because, you know, as, as long as everybody treats them really nice and everybody, everything's warm and fuzzy and. And it just sort of feels good and it sort of fixes some problems at home. And, you know, and that's really all they've got in mind. But, you know, the early church didn't think that way. And Paul didn't think that way. And the guys that turned the world upside down, they didn't think that way. And that's why they were not derailed by undercurrent and they were not derailed by, you know, uh, getting beaten and getting stoned and having to run for their life and having, having churches forsake them. They were not derailed by that. They weren't walking around with a chip on their shoulder, you know, in their hurt feelings and telling their sad stories about how Christians hurt them. Not these guys. Because they didn't join a social club to test the water to make sure everybody was really going to be nice. That's not what they joined for. You know, they, they did a study of the reasons people come to churches. And they, you know, they, they took a look at the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, you know. And, and in those time periods, you know, people came to church for different reasons. In the 50s and 60s, you know, people came to church based on the doctrine. You know, they wanted to make sure the church believed the right things. And then in the 70s, and I, I forget the progression, but um, um, one of the final stages in that progression was, uh, was the programs. And people would make the choice based on uh, the programs. Um, you know, um, I remember at our church when I pastored in Prince Albert, um, we had, you know, a pretty young crowd like we have here. And, um, and we, we got, some, we got a few old folks, but we had a pretty young crowd. And, um, I remember a lady that, that left our church and, and bless her heart. She, we loved her and she loved us and she still loves us to this day. But, um, but you know, um, when she left, this is what she said. She said, you know, Pastor Newman, she said, you know, I'm just, you know, here I am. She says, and my, I'm in my 60s. And she said, there's just there's just really nobody here for me. And um, she said, you know, you you got such a young congregation and and uh, and I'm not I'm not I'm not making fun of her and I'm not belittling her. So don't misunderstand what I'm getting at. Uh, but what I am getting at is that a lot of people choose a church. Um, you know, I, I know when um, when people come and they talk to me and this and that and the other, you know, um, a lot of times they're looking for something. But they're not looking for the Word of God and they're not looking for the Spirit of God and they're not looking for something that's going to change their life and they're not looking for something that's going to, that's going to radically affect them. But that's not what they're looking for. They're just looking for a nice place to come in and feel comfortable. And um, in other words, they're not interested in warfare. And I, I don't know how many times I've looked at my wife and, and I've said to her, well, we won't have them long because we can't, we can't give what they're looking for. You know, um, um, he talked about the weapons of a warfare. The weapons of a warfare. Um, in Exodus 15, 3, it says, The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. 
Um, you know, over and 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 over. God is called the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts. And the word host is a military term. You run it through the scriptures and you'll see the book of Judges. It talks about the hosts of Midian. It's talking about their military divisions. OK, he's the Lord of hosts. You know, we could second Timothy three. Um, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of his life. Uh, thou therefore, my son, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Uh, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Paul comes to the end of his life and he says, I have fought. I have fought a good fight. And you know, uh, as I'm talking to you believers tonight, you know, uh, if there's a lot of things in your life, if you're going to make them happen, it's going to be because you're going to Fight for it. I mean, you're going to get on your knees and everything's going to be against you and your heart's going to be breaking and it looks like you're losing the battle and you're going to get on your knees and you're going to plead with God and you're going to plead with God and you're going to keep going and you're going to fight. I've watched people lose their kids over and over and over. You know what? When they realized it was going to be a whole pile of work and a serious fight. They just checked out. And of course, everybody knows where the kids go after that. It's just a matter of time. And then they'll, they'll give their retarded statement. Oh, I did the best I could. Oh, that'll come out at Judgment Day. It's a fight. I've watched people lose their marriage because they wouldn't fight. You know, there's a lot of things about the Christian life. You know, it, you know, the Christian life works if you're ready to declare war. Yeah. Had a friend of mine. He's a much older man than I. He's about in the grave now. He's like in his 90s. He was one of the most influential people in my whole life. And uh, he had six kids, five kids. Five sons and a daughter. All five sons went to the ministry and his daughter went to the mission field and she she died of liver cancer on the mission field. And and uh, and there were some, there was some grief among the sons and some issues and some problems. But but all that to say they uh, they served God. You know what he told the Lord on his honeymoon night? On their honeymoon night, him and his wife got to the motel. <laughs> Much more spiritual than I. And he says, they got on their knees beside the bed and said, oh, Lord God, if you will give us our children in your service, we won't ask for anything else. We will be satisfied. Well, you know, their life wasn't perfect, just like nobody's life is perfect. You know, there's no such thing as a nice, normal family. <laughs> Normal family. I had a preacher of mine who says, I've learned there is no such thing. And there's no family without issues. There's no family without battles. And just because they come to church and they're smiling and it looks good, it may be good. But if it's good, there's some warfare going on in the background. And they're fighting to hold the ground. And they're not fighting among each other. They're fighting against the darkness. And he said, you know, he said, my oldest son, my oldest son. He said he was a, about 18 and he said I was at church and he pastored a, a larger church and, you know, two or three phone lines in the church. And and he said, I picked up the phone and he said, I heard my oldest son. And he said, my oldest son didn't know I could hear on. The, he didn't know I had picked up the other line. And he said, my son was talking to one of his friends and they were going to go to a wild party. And he said, I listened. He said, about broke my heart. He said, I hung my phone up. He said, my son didn't know I'd heard. And he said, I got on my knees and I started praying. And then he said, and then I got off my knees and I started screaming. And he started screaming. He said, I, I can't really imitate it, but he said, he said, Satan, you can't have my son. And he started screaming and praying and pleading with God. Well, uh, 
his son never went to that party. And um, long story short, six or eight months later, that son who had professed to be saved as a little boy, his son got saved. And his whole world changed. Do you know what happened? The average parent would have been an idiot. The average parent would have, you know, been more concerned about the embarrassment and their reputation and everything. He wasn't worried about that. He wanted to see his son rescued. And he went to war. Look at verse 5. Still describing the warfare. It says, casting down imaginations. You know, uh, Paul is writing and he's got these troublemakers in view. And he doesn't, we don't, we don't know if he even knew who they were. But he knew there was this group that was creating an undercurrent. And Paul says, uh, you know, he says, we're not, we're not warring after the flesh here. He said, uh, he said, you know, I'm casting down even imaginations about what I'm going to do here. Casting down imaginations. You know where a lot of the battle will be fought? It'll be fought in your mind. You know, before before you open your mouth, before you do something, you know, you're you know you know how we are. We we listen and we hear and we're making judgment calls. And and a lot of that's going on right here. You know what uh, the old saying goes, behind every terribly wicked act is a long process of evil thinking. And the battle is the mind. The battle is the mind. Casting down imaginations. Verse 6, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience. Paul said, uh, you know, he said, um, he said inside of us as we're writing this letter and we're, we're uh, you know, getting ready to visit Corinth again. And he said, we're sending out this letter first. But he said, uh, inside, he said, I have a readiness to revenge all disobedience. He said, now, you know, he says, I'm, he says, I'm praying. And he said, the, the, he says, I'm, I'm ready to go to warfare here. He said, uh, he said, and I am, uh, he said, but I am ready to deal with the troublemakers. Look at verse seven. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? And this is the, this is the problem with, with the undercurrent. Okay, with the people that really weren't happy about what was going on. He said, do you look? It's where they, the way they looked at things. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? Um, for whatever reason, these guys were uh, against Paul. Um, it had to do with the way they were looking at things. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. 1 Corinthians 14. The problem. The problem is the way they were looking at things. Look at um, verse 7. I'm sorry. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. Paul writes and he says, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Look at Psalm 54. Psalm 54. Psalm 54. Psalm 54. And um, the problem was that they were... He says, do you, do you look on things after the outward appearance? Whatever their problem was with Paul and his influence and whatever they, you know, things were happening at the church of Corinth. People were getting right with God and things were really happening. But you had this group in the church 
that wasn't happy about that. It is the craziest thing in the world. Um, years ago, I, I don't want to, if I, if I get away from Psalm 54, somebody wave at me if I forget it. Um, we, had a, we had a revival meeting at our church in Saskatchewan. And we had a, a great old pastor in who was, who was uh, an evangelist, and he was in his 60s, and he was a tremendous preacher. And, and it was Sunday morning, and I don't even remember what he preached, but it was great. And one of my guys, one of my faithful guys, came forward that morning uh, weeping at the altar. And um, I said, Brother So-and-so, what's up? And he said, I need to get saved. This was one of my dads, one of the guys that had been with us, one of the guys that had been in Bible-believing churches for years. And, you know, uh, he had said he was saved and, and, you know, he had been a deacon at his last church, and he said, he said, I need to get saved. I thought it was wonderful. I was just, I was just thrilled. And uh, so he, uh, he, he, you know, got things fixed up between him and the Lord that morning. And, and um, man, it was amazing. And so the service is over, and we've said the final amen, and I'm at the back door, and I am greet people as they walk out. And I had, a, I had another guy. And he comes up to me, and I said, hey, man, how you doing? I went to shake his hand, and he goes, he goes, he goes that was terrible. I'm never coming back here. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I don't like the way you gave that invitation. And he just started ranting, and I'm like, what in the world? You know what? There's some people, they are not happy with what the Lord is doing. You know what? They look at the outward appearance and they see something that bothers them like they're the grand pooba and they're going to be the final authority and they can't see past the end of their nose and they can't see that God is doing something. You know, I got a way I like to see things done. And you know, every preacher's like that. And I got things I don't really care for. But you know, you got you to gotta learn that sometimes God operates outside your little box. And I'm not talking about speaking in tongues and doing, you know, six foot flip flops out the back door. I'm not talking about that. Years ago, there was a, an evangelist and he was preaching a, a meeting at a, at, a, at a big church. And, um, and he got up one night and he gave the invitation. And I don't know how he gave the invitation, but the pastor was not pleased with how he gave the invitation. So the evangelist was at a motel room. And the pastor sent one of his men the next morning. He says, go, go to so-and-so's room at the motel room and tell him I do not want him handling tomorrow night's invitation. He said, I will handle it. And I'm sure the evangelist would have agreed to that. But the guy from the church goes, gets to the motel door, goes to knock, and he hears him praying. And he's praying out loud, you know, and he hears him pray. So he, he thinks what, <laughs> what all the rest of us think. Oh, he'll be done in a minute. He stands there for 10 minutes, and then he stands there for half an hour, and then he stands there for an hour, and then he stands there for an hour and a half, and then he stands there for two hours, and the guy's still praying. And he left. And so he goes back, and the pastor goes, did you tell him? And uh, the guy said, well, pastor, said, I stood there for two hours. And he was still praying. Listen to what the pastor said. He said, if he spends that much time with God, I don't care how he gives the invitation. You know what he could do? He could see past the appearance. And he could see God at work. You know the trouble with these guys here that were not happy with what was going on? They couldn't see God. I mean, this is Paul. And they've got a beef with Paul. Look at Psalm 54, verse 3. This is David. Look what David said. David said in Psalm 54, verse 3, For strangers are risen up against me, and oppressors seek after my soul. Uh, David had undercurrent in his kingdom. Now look what he says. They have not set God before them. 
They have not set God before them. When you come to church, you know, when the Lord is working, uh, can, can, you see, can you see the Lord? You ever been in a service where God is moving? We're, I, we should probably stop with this. You ever been in a service and God's working? You ever notice that the way people respond to that? Some people are just thrilled and man, they are in tune. And there's other people that are just uncomfortable. I mean, they're just uncomfortable. And um, you can just, uh, you can just, you can see it, you can feel it. Some people, the ones that love God and want God, see a bunch of people, they don't have a clue what church is about. You see, it's not about, it's not about God to some people. Oh, they would deny that, but it's not about God. Oh, no. It's just about having a nice place, you know, where we can come, we can sing a few songs, hear a little preaching, and we'll feel good about ourselves. That's the tragedy of 2020. It's the church without God. Revelation 3, Jesus is outside. Outside a church. We use it for sinners and it fits. But the context of Revelation 3 is a church. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. He said, but they won't let me in. But they won't let me in. God gets moving in a church service. And, and I know how some guys are. They'll drag it out and they'll push it and they'll prime it and they'll try to work it, you know, and it's all foolishness. I understand that. But you know, I'm, you, you know what I'm referring to though. I'm talking about when God is at work. And you know what some people are doing? God really gets moving. People start getting right with God. And here's some dude over there and he's looking at his clock and he's going, and you can tell he's getting restless and he's playing with his keys. And Do you know why he's doing that? Because all he can see is the outward appearance. You say, it's easy for you to say, preacher. Oh no, I've had to get up and go to work. I know what it's like to be at church till 11.30 and get up and feel like a truck ran over you the next morning. Is not God worth it to you? Isn't, isn't he worth it? See, it all depends on what you're looking at. Are you looking at the outward appearance? Or do you see God? Let's pray. Lord, bless your truth tonight. Lord, to my knowledge, I don't have any undercurrent here, and God, I thank you for that. But Lord, you know, this is where we're at in 2 Corinthians right now, and